Good morning. Uh, if you are a guest with us today, we'd like to welcome you. Uh, Patty's got all kind of family with her today, her brother and all his, his posse, uh, seven girls. Wow. <laughs> you need prayer, brother. You need prayer. Uh, what a great, great heritage. So welcome. Welcome this morning. If you are a guest, there's some cards in the backs of the chairs. If you'll take one of those cards and fill it out, take it by the welcome desk on your way out. We'll send you a letter and just kind of get to know you a little better. You guys doing all right? Yeah. You know, as I've been, um, I've, I've kind of been digging into the book of Jeremiah, and uh, there's a couple main themes that take place here. Uh, it's no mystery. There is a, uh, a great call of God on the people of God to walk in a new way. And as I've, as I've kind of read this, and, and, and we're going to, we got a long way to go. Jeremiah is a, a long book. So hopefully uh, you're staying with it, studying it, reading it on your own, and listening to what the Lord would have to say to you. But one of the things that I'm beginning to recognize is this, this mental image of a, um, a, a, a wife who has cheated on her husband. And this, this intimate love that the father has with uh, his bride, and now the bride has stepped away. And, and this theme just keeps reoccurring over and over again. And so really, I'm, I, as, I'm, as my mind is trying to wrap my head around what, what God is saying to us, it's almost as if there's a cry you know, we, we sing about the love of Jesus, right? And we know how deep and how wide his love is and how incredibly powerful his mercy and his grace is in our lives. And those things are so important and so much so needed in the body of Christ. But what we've got to remember is that love is to be poured back to him from us. And it just seems like Jeremiah, God's voice through Jeremiah is calling out, to his people and giving them a warning, a, a, a sign that, that the, the direction they're heading in is, is not a good place. In fact, in, uh, in verse 10, in chapter 5, and, and by the way, if you're a note taker today and you love filling in the blanks, I got a whole page for you to just take your own notes. All right, today's going to be a little different than we have been. So is that okay? Can we take a little break from that? And hear my heart today? Well, I'm going to do it anyway, so here we go. <laughs> Don't, you know. uh, God says, go down the rows of vineyards and rip out the vines, but not all of them. Leave a few. Prune back those vines, that, that growth that didn't come from God. They've betrayed me over and over again. Judah and Israel both. This is God's decree. They've spread lies about God. They've said there's nothing to him. Nothing bad will happen to us. Neither famine nor war will come our way. The prophets all are windbags. They speak nothing but nonsense. Therefore, this is what God says to me, God of the angel armies. Because they have talked this way, they're going to eat those words. Watch now. I am putting my words as fire in your mouth, and the people are a pile of kindling ready to go up in flames. Attention, I'm bringing a far-off nation against you, O house of Israel, God's decree, a solid nation, an ancient nation, a nation that speaks another language. You won't understand a word they say, and when they aim their arrows, you're as good as dead. They're a nation of real fighters. They'll clean you out of house and home, rob you of crops and children alike. They'll feast on your sheep and your cattle, strip your vines and fig trees, and the fortresses they have that made you feel safe, leveled with a stroke of the sword. And even then, as bad as it will be, God's decree, it will not be the end of the world for you. And when people ask, why did God do all this to us? You must say to them, it's tit for tat. Just as you left me and served foreign gods in your own country, so now you must serve foreigners 
in their own country. So then listen to these words of God. Tell the house of Jacob this. Put this Put out this bulletin in Judah. Listen to this, you scatterbrained airheads with eyes that see but don't really look, with ears that hear but don't really listen. Why don't you honor me? Why aren't you in awe before me? Yes, me, the, who made the shorelines to contain the ocean waters. I drew a line in the sand. I drew a line in the sand and cannot be crossed. Waves roll in but cannot get through. Breakers crash, but that's the end of them. But this people, what a people. Uncontrollable, untamable runaways. It never occurs to them to say, how can we honor God with our lives? The God who gives rain and both spring and autumn and maintains the rhythm of the seasons, who sets aside time Uh, each year for harvest and keeps everything running smoothly for us. Of course you don't. Your bad behavior blinds you to all this. Your sins keep my blessings at a distance. You see, my prayer for you, our prayer for you as pastors, is not just to create good citizens. You know, church people sometimes are the hardest people to reach because you've heard it all before. You've been in church long enough to know the routine, to know how it goes, to know what it is you're to say and how you're to act on Sunday. The danger in that is it has the potential of bringing us to a place of of being numb before God. And so in essence, the issue is our love for him. In John chapter 21, Jesus asks Peter, do you love me? Do you love me? Now, if you remember this story, Jesus had just risen from the dead. And just days before that, he'd had a conversation with Peter. And he told the disciples what was getting ready to happen and how they were going to deny him. And Peter said, not me. Not me. I'll never deny you. I'll never. In fact, everyone else might fail you, but not me. This isn't going to happen on my watch. Jesus said, Pete, I love you, man. But before the rooster crows, before dawn, you're going to deny me three times. And I could just hear Peter as he walked away. We'll see about it. Right? And so there he is in, the, in, that, in that courtyard, and the soldiers are abusing Jesus. And where Jesus used to, where Peter used to walk close with Jesus, when they were, when he was discipling them and mentoring, and Peter was always right there with him. But the scripture says that Peter followed from a distance. Why was he following from a distance now? And they accused him of being one of his followers. He said, I don't know him. I don't know him. Three different times, three different people asked him, aren't you one of those guys? Aren't you one of the Galileans? You're with him. And he just said, I don't know him. And after that third time, that rooster crowed and Jesus caught eyes with Peter. And he's like, oh my God. I've fallen away. I've done exactly what he said. And it says that he wept bitterly. So now there's a scene on a shore. The disciples are out fishing and Jesus has started a little fire on the beach. And the disciples recognize him on the shore and they hurry to the shore with a net full of fish that Jesus caught from the shore. 
And as Peter pulls himself up out of the water, because he wasn't, uh, he couldn't wait on the boat, he jumps in the water and swims. And he gets to the shoreline, and there's Jesus. And so there's conversation, and then it says that somehow Jesus kind of pulled Peter over to the side, and he says, Peter, do you love me? Yes, I love you. Well, then feed my sheep. Peter, do you love me? Uh, of, of course I do. Then Jesus said, well, great, feed my sheep. Peter, do you love me? And it seems like Peter's getting a little bit aggravated at the repetitive question. He's like, but Lord, you know everything. Of course you know that I love you. What if Jesus were to walk in this room right now? And what if he were to look at you and say, Joe, do you love me? You see, love requires a response. You want to know how I knew that my sons loved me when they were growing up? Was it because they would snuggle up next to me and say, Daddy, I love you? Because when they did that, I was always ready with the next statement, what do you want? <laughs> you ever heard that before? We're working you like a pack mule. But you want to know what really told me that my sons love me? Is when I said, hey, go clean your room. And I walk in an hour later, and it's clean. And after I picked myself up off the floor because I passed out, I knew they loved me. Because love requires a response. Wednesday night, I shared some of this teaching in the stu with the students for the youth group. And I, got, I began this, the teaching and I said, I love you guys. I really Love you. And to show you that I love you, tonight when we're done, everybody's getting free pizza. And they're like, dude, I'd run, run up and hug me. Because love requires a response. So think of that for a minute. If Jesus was to get up and walk in this room and look you eye to eye and say, do you love me? I mean, I, I know what I would say. Yeah, I guess. I, I think I do. I don't know. You ever ask someone a real simple question and they know the answer and then you say it again and they're like, oh, yeah. And you ask them a third time, they're like, maybe I'm getting the wrong answer here. Has that ever happened to you? Okay, I'm going to do a little survey. I'm, I'm going to, let's suppose that you guys are, have a mission. You have a, a job to do today. And your job is to find out whether or not I love my wife. You see, Friday night, my wife and I celebrated 33 years of marriage. Can you believe it, Barbara? 33 years? You've, you have put up with me for 33 years, right? And my wife is... My wife is a Facebook stealth, usually. But this weekend, how many of you have seen all the stuff she's posting about our journey together, man? I'm, I'm crying on the, I'm, I'm listening to this music, and I'm like, girl, you got to stop. She goes, oh, I ain't done yet. She's, she's only up to like 15 years of marriage. I'm like, yeah, I know, I know. What are you going to do? But we do. We have a great marriage. But if, if your job today was to investigate into to ask me a question to find out if I really love my wife, what would your question be? And I'm going to take notes. So raise your hand. What would be a question that you would ask me that would prove that I love my wife? Yes. What have I done? What have you done for me lately? Okay. <laughs> Hang on. I don't write in shorthand here. What have you done to show her lately. That I, all right. All 
All right. What's another one? Yes. Do I, am I affectionate towards her? PDA, baby. Nancy, you had one? Ooh. I hope so. All right. What else? Yes. What makes I th- what makes me think I love her? I don't know. That's a tough one. All right, what else? Yes, Danny. Woo, that's a good question, man. I I'm going to hate you asked it. What? <laughs> Easy. I can take that stole from you. I'll steal your stole. <laughs> What well, say it again, man? He got me all messed up. Wow, man! My wife's gonna ask me to keep this. Let's start off. <laughs> how can I make your day better? Or how can I please you? A couple more. Yes. I want your opinion. I'll give it to you. (laughs) And do I spend time communicating? I am in so I am so in trouble. One more. Yes. Oh. <laughs> Even when I'm mad at her, I don't get mad. <laughs> I get even. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> All right. These are great, great questions. So, Jesus said that the greatest commandment of all is what? To love God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to mess with you for a minute. And I'm going to ask you these questions regarding your love relationship with Jesus. See how I did that? What have you done to show him you love him lately? Are you affectionate to him? When you hear the name Jesus, does it just, or is it business as usual? Do you create memories with him? What makes you think that you love him? Do you start off every day by saying, how can I please you? Do you spend time with no technology, no phone, no TV, just sitting there talking to him? Do you love Jesus even though things don't turn out the way you wanted them to and you're mad at him? You see, you told me these are the things that would show you and convince you that I love my wife. How much more important is uh, is it for us to have these kinds of attributes with our relationship with him? Him. You see, the whole book of Jeremiah is all about a people who walked away from this beautiful relationship that God wants to have. 
And so we determine that love requires obedience. Jesus said, if you love me, you will obey me. Didn't he? We forget that. We forget that love and obedience go together. I had one of the students, because I asked this question Wednesday night, I had one of the students say, would you die for her? Would you die for him? Would you be willing to lay down your life for him? You see, God just doesn't want casual followers. He wants people who are willing to put it all on the line. So let me ask you a question. Let's say you guys left church and you went home and, um, uh, and all of you decide, all of, let's say everyone but you and your family decided they don't want to go to church anymore. And sometimes that happens to people. Your spouse walks away from God. Let's say your spouse walks away from God. Your kids decide they don't want to go anymore, and your spouse says, well, they can stay home with me. Would you still be committed to following Christ? Would you still be committed to being a part of a church family, even though you're, let's say your entire family said, we don't believe anymore? Would it make a difference? Would you still, would you say to them, I love you and, and I hate what's happened to you, but I am going to follow Christ because I am in love with Jesus. In Matthew 10, 21, Jesus says, to him that endures to the end. Because there'll come a day where it says that Jesus is going to bring division between families, husbands, wives, fathers, children. Can we hold true to our commitments to him even though everyone else around us, around us gives up? Can you be in love with Jesus when you're all by yourself? Occasionally, in 33 years, my wife has asked me, um, is there anything I do that bugs you? <laughs> and, you know, hesitantly, because I know that's a loaded question, uh, I'll say, well, yeah, there's a couple things, and so we'll talk about it. And then I'll say, well, what about me? And then she pulls her list out. <laughs> and, I, you know, I, and I go through the list. But you know what? When we've had conversations like that, you know what the response is? I do everything that I can not to do the stuff that bugs her. And in turn... If there's something that she does that just really grates against me, she does everything that she can not to do that which bothers me. Now think about that in relationship to your love relationship with Jesus. If there's something in you that you know offends God, are you willing to watch vigilantly over your life? It's like the psalmist David in Psalm 139. Let me, let me read this for you. Let's go to the Old Testament here. Psalm 139, you know, David is, 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 is talking about, you know, Jesus, you created me, you know me, you love me, you created me in my mother's womb. But listen to the very end of the chapter. He says, search me, God, and know my heart. Search me. Test me. Know my anxious thoughts. See if there are any offensive ways in me and lead me in the way everlasting. Just like I, I try to find ways to love my wife and to, 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 to not purposefully anger her or frustrate her, it must be our same desires as followers of Christ to pray this, God, search me. Know my heart. Know anything in me. If there's anything in me that is be getting between us, take it out. Lead me in the path of everlasting life.
If you were to ask God that question, is there anything in me that offends you? What would he say? Is there anything about the way I live that bothers you? What would he say? Would he break out a list? You see, Jesus says there's a natural response to love. If you love me, you'll obey me. You see, when we invite Jesus into our lives, the Bible says we become a slave to righteousness. You know what that means? If I'm over here and I'm living my Christian life and I'm holding on to sin, when I'm in church, I'm miserable. I mean, I'm not talking about occasional sin, you know, when someone cuts you off in traffic or your wife or your husband says something or you, 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 you it's kind of one of those sins, you do it and you're like, 